I'm Myrna Dunham, and I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Ames. I'm pleased to see so many people here tonight, and I hope. Try it. Go ahead. Try it now. Okay. <laughs> I'm Myrna Dunham, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Ames. I'm pleased to see so many people here tonight, and I hope our being together will give us an opportunity to get acquainted with one another and also to stimulate our thinking in the areas of land use. Marilyn Haynes, our Environmental Quality Program Chairperson, and her committee have worked very hard to put this meeting together tonight. And as we begin to consider tonight the subject of land use, and we move from discussion at the theoretical to the simulated aspects of the program, Marilyn will keep us informed and she'll also keep things moving. Thank you very much. Marilyn. Good afternoon. I, too, would like to welcome each one of you to our land use conference. I feel that we have an excellent program planned, and I hope that you will find it very worthwhile. Today's conference is part of a series of conferences being held around the state this fall by the Citizens Information Service of the League of Women Voters of Iowa through a grant from the Iowa Board for Public Programs in the Humanities. I would like to introduce, first of all, the coordinator of the conferences throughout the state, uh, Georgine Shank. Will you stand? Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh, Georgine is also a member of the Ames League Women Voters, and we want to thank her for all of the work that she's done in connection with the conferences. We do know that there are many people here this afternoon who deserve to be introduced, but we do want to adhere as closely as possible as we can to our schedule. So perhaps we can simply introduce those in attendance who are newly elected to public office in past Tuesday's general election. Uh, I believe John Murray, st State Senator for the 21st District, is here. And Reed Crawford, Representative for the 42nd District. Uh, our City Council Member Barbara Kerber, who has also been recently appointed to the uh, interim study committee on land use for the state legislature. She's not newly elected, but she is one of our council members. And also Mr. Joe Maxwell, who again wasn't, is, is a city council member. And Johnny Hammond, newly elected member of the County Board of Supervisors. Okay. I do want to mention that we have a publications table outside I the double doors in the hall where our publications chairperson Barbara, Barbara Worley is displaying numerous publications on the subject of land use as well as a few others that we felt you might find interesting. Some of these publications are free and others are available for a small charge. So be sure that you do stop by and, and look at these sometime during the conference. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the conference. Dr. Stuart Burns is a professor of English at Drake University. Dr. Burns holds degrees from Parsons College, Drake University, and the University of Wisconsin. His publications include works on John Steinbeck, Mark Twain, Frank Norris, Flannery O'Connor, and Gene Stafford. <coughs> Dr. D Dr. Burns began his tenure at Drake University in 1963. I am pleased to present Dr. Stuart Burns to speak on Daniel Boone and Johnny Appleseed, Contradictory Nature Mythology in American Fiction. Dr. Burns. Let me begin with a confession and a change. Uh, it's always a uh, dangerous business to title your speech before you write it. <laughs> uh, so uh, if uh, 
Paul Bunyan creeps surreptitiously into it as we go along. Uh, he should have been there in the first place. <clears throat> On the last page of F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby, the narrator, Nick Carraway, has a vision of what Long Island must have looked like to the first explorers who viewed it. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. The dream Fitzgerald alludes to is the dream of an ideal America, specifically Thomas Jefferson's dream of an American society of self-sufficient landholders. How that dream was betrayed is the story the novel tells of Jay Gatsby, a farm boy from the Midwest who early embarks upon a course of self-improvement but who mistakenly assumes that the term is synonymous with getting rich. But the concrete symbol of that betrayal appears in chapter two of the novel, <laughs> where once was a fresh green breast of the new world flowering for Dutch sailors' eyes is now a dumping ground for industrial waste, plus the other refuse discarded by the millions of people living in the crowded conditions of America's largest city. Located over this wasteland is a billboard on which is painted two enormous eyes looking through a pair of spectacles and advertising the services of an optometrist, Dr. T. J. Eckelberg. The sign symbolizes America's loss of vision. The scene as a whole suggests that the dream of an agrarian democracy has culminated in this valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens. Presided over blindly by Jefferson's 20th century counterpart, Thomas Jefferson Eckelberg. Most of us will have no trouble discovering where our sympathies lie, given such extreme alternatives. We deplore ash heaps and automobile graveyards. We want, so nearly as is possible, to return our American landscape to some semblance of Nick Carraway's vision. The problem is that so soon as there's settlement, the trees which once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams must come down to make way for Gatsby's or whoever's house. For thousands of years before the white man came to America, the Indians enjoyed a relatively unchanging landscape, but there were not so many of them. Their population remained low due primarily to tribal warfare and depressed, by our standards, living conditions. Few of us would subscribe to a solution of population control by controlled warfare. Nor are we willing to give up the good life we enjoy to live hand to mouth as the Indians did. Nor could we if we would. The point is made by William Faulkner in his short novel, The Bear, in a scene in which Ike McCaslin refuses title to his Mississippi plantation upon coming of age. Factors which lead him to do so are too complex to cover here but one of his reasons is clearly pertinent to the question of land use and property ownership. When his cousin attempts to dissuade him from repudiating his inheritance, Ike replies, I can't repudiate it. It was never mine to repudiate. It was never father's to bequeath me to repudiate because it was never grandfather's to bequeath him to bequeath me to repudiate because it was never old Ikamo Tubi's to sell to grandfather in the first place. Because on the instant when Ikamo Tubi, who was an Indian original Indian at the time, because on the instant when Ikamo Tubi discovered that he could sell it for money, on that instant it ceased to have been his forever, and the man who bought it bought nothing. God created the earth, says Ike, and peopled it with dumb creatures, and then he created man to be his overseer over the earth and the animals on it, but not to hold for himself inviolable title forever to the oblongs and squares of land. Ike's argument that man has no moral right to property at all is clearly idealistic and one might say beside the point. In fact, Faulkner shows it to be beside the point. Ike does refuse his inheritance, whereupon 
It devolves by law upon his cousin, who continues the tradition of exploitation and defacement against which Ike has been protesting. But Faulkner's equation of property ownership with the necessary defacement of the landscape and with the ensuing depletion of natural resources is sound. Once we began settling the country in earnest, it was necessary to destroy the fresh green breast of the new world. The question is, are the ash heaps necessary? The truth of the matter is that our relationship with nature is necessarily ambiguous. Again, Faulkner's novel is instructive. Ike McCaslin argues eloquently against property ownership and mourns the passing of the wilderness which has been sold by his landholder friend, Major Despain, to a lumber company. But Ike has for years joined Despain and others in a yearly hunt for old Ben, the bearer of the title and a symbol in the story of the very spirit of the wilderness itself. Furthermore, after he re repudiates his plantation inheritance, he, Ike supports himself by becoming a carpenter. And where, we ask, do his materials come from? Presumably, they come from the very wilderness he has mourned the passing of. Faulkner and the Bear presents one of the most profound studies of land use in American literature, and I wish to return to this discussion of this novel later. Suffice it to say at this point that Faulkner clearly recognizes, as should we, that no purely idealistic attitude toward nature is practical or possible. That man is more than just the overseer of nature that Ike McCaslin would have him be is a point Nathaniel Hawthorne makes tellingly in his short story, The Maypole of Marymount. Placing an actual historical event into fictional context, Hawthorne proposes that at a very early stage in our history, the colonists engaged in a struggle which decided the ideological direction America's future would follow. On the one side of the conflict are the solemn, intolerant, psalm-singing, iron-willed Puritans. Mm -hmm. On the other, the gentler, more tolerant, pagan, fun-loving colonists of the Marymount community. A primary distinction Hawthorne draws between the two communities is that of their attitude towards nature. The Marymount colonists are children of nature, bedecking themselves with flowers and dancing around the maypole, which is itself a nature symbol of fertility used by primitive societies in the celebration of spring. The Puritans, on the other hand, are sternly bent on subduing nature to their own interests by clearing the forests, planting crops, and, quote, proclaiming bounties on the heads of wolves and the scalps of Indians. Hawthorne makes no secret of his emotional sympathy with the fun-loving children of nature. But a passage in description of the maypole dancers suggests just as clearly his sense that such a life is neither possible nor fitting to the founders of a nation. There was the likeness of a bear erect, brute in all but his hind legs, which were adorned in pink silk stockings. And here again, almost as wondrous, stood a real bear of the dark forest, lending each of his forepaws to the grasp of a human hand and as ready for the dance as any in that circle. His inferior nature rose halfway to meet his companions as they stooped. We may not wish to agree with Hawthorne's implication here that man in a state of nature lowers himself to the level of a tamed beast, but we cannot, I think, deny his assertion that the settlement of America depended for its success on a cold determination to conquer nature, to tame the land and subjugate its, its inhabitants, human and otherwise, to his needs, and in process, to deface the land and deplete our natural resources. Fitzgerald, Faulkner, and Hawthorne all make reference to a kind of American golden age, an age which they regard as irrecoverable. Were that all they had to say to us, we might logically dismiss them as irrelevant speakers to an age which has become concerned about ecology and conservation. What we want, we argue, are solutions, writers who are future-minded, not past-bound. True. But our future stems from our past in ways we are hardly conscious of, but which we need to be conscious of if we are to solve the problems of land use. An example may illustrate my point that we define ourselves by our attitude towards the past. 
Shortly after our entrance into World War II, and many of you will, I hope, remember this, there was a popular patriotic song entitled, There's a Star Spangled Banner Waving Somewhere. The lyrics of the song describe a kind of modern Valhalla for great American heroes. The song's central character, if a song can be said to have a central character, expresses a desire to be worthy to join a select circle of past heroes made up of, and I quote the chorus, Lincoln, Custer, Washington, and Perry, Nathan Hale, and Colin Kelly, too. I would propose that the confrontation at Wounded Knee in the spring of 1973, or rather, the causes that necessitated that confrontation, are implicit in the assumption in that song that nor numbers George Armstrong Custer in the front ranks of American heroes. To put it another way, Americans in 1940 responded primarily to the mythic Custer, who died heroically at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, ignoring the added historical dimension of the Custer who also massacred Indian men, women, and children at Sand Creek and the Washita. In one important sense, myths are dramatized versions of the past we choose to believe in. In addition, they provide a measurable index of our current attitudes and beliefs. And it is in this context that the legends of Paul Bunyan, Johnny Appleseed, and Daniel Boone become important. I will admit that the selection of these figures from our historical past is partially arbitrary. Yet there is some common ground for comparison. All three are folk heroes behind which stand legitimate historical figures. In each case, the historical facts present us with a personage somewhat less admirable than do the mythic details we popularly believe or accept. And I hope I'm not belaboring the obvious when I point out that in each case, the myth is associated with the issue of the vanished wilderness, with those trees that made way for Gatsby's house. <laughs> the Bunyan and Appleseed legends embody two opposing attitudes toward nature. And in our re affirmative response to both, we betray our own contradictory impulses regarding land use. For the fact is that if we are successfully to deal with our environmental problems, if we are to use our resources wisely in the future, then we must learn to recognize the inadequacy of both of these myths to our present condition, and we must pay closer attention to the truths the Daniel Boone legend dramatizes for us. Basically, the Paul Bunyan legend reflects our unthinking exploitation of natural resources through our optimistic pursuit of progress and the good life. I'm assuming here that uh, uh, we don't need a lot of context about these people, that, that we all have a kind of general sense. Paul Bunyan, the kind of happy-go-lucky chopper down of trees in the Northwood Forest, not a very intelligent man in terms of the uh, legend, but a uh, uh, nice guy. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Appleseed, the uh, kind of tattered figure who <laughs> wandered over the, uh, the Mideast, uh, uh, planting uh, with apple seeds in his pocket. Uh, Daniel Boone we'll get to later. Uh, okay. Basically, let me repeat. Basically, the Paul Bunyan legend reflects our unthinking exploitation of natural resources through our optimistic pursuit of progress and the good life. The Johnny Appleseed legend reflects our contrary desire to preserve or restore nature and to escape the consequences of progress. During the entire 19th century and for most of, if not all of the 20th, our actions have been bunionistic, our sentiments Appleseedish. For the, <laughs> for the paradoxical fact is that even as smokestacks and skyscrapers replaced the church steeples and water towers as the telltale landmarks of our society, even as our cities grew like bizarre concrete organisms, even as our air, water, and noise pollution increased, so did our literature of escape to nature increase in volume and in popularity. The kind of pastoral, primitive, pioneer fiction that one finds in such turn-of-the-century writers as Gene Stratton Porter, John Fox, Jr., <coughs> Harold Bell Wright, B.M. Bauer, and Zane Gray, exemplify our Appleseedish nostalgia for a pre-Bunionized America. Nor was the trend limited to popular fiction only. 
Cooper's five volume leather stocking tales, Mark Twain's Huck Finn floating down the Mississippi and then lighting out for the territory to get rid of the constraints of civilization, Hemingway's Nick Adams fishing the big two-hearted river, Steinbeck's Paisanos of Tortilla Flat and Cannery Row living their primitive and carefree lives, uh, even J.D. Salinger's Holden Caulfield with this dream of he has of a hermit cabin in the mountains. All of these reflect the Appleseedish desire for a return to an unurbanized, unindustrialized, uncrowded landscape unmarred by the products of the good life. The problem, of course, is that Appleseedish literature has tended to sentimentalize and distort the past. Take, for example, Richard Brodigan's Trout Fishing in America, a novel that has achieved some popularity in the last few years. On a surface level, the book details the adventures of one man's search for the ideal trout stream, a search that is consistently frustrated. The streams he fishes are in one way or another polluted, fished out, or over-commercialized. And the crowning insult comes when he does find a trout stream that's decent, one that is cut into somewhat manageable lengths and is selling for $6.50 a foot by the Cleveland Wrecking Yard, a company that has moved the stream, quote, with loving care from the mountains of Colorado into the heart of San Francisco. <laughs> there is, in addition to the, the narrator, another character who is uh, named, incredibly enough, Trout Fishing in America. Uh, this character is a kind of uh, symbolic... Uh, symbol, I suppose you'd say, of the American past. And trout fishing in America remembers uh, people in three-cornered hats fishing in the dawn. And on one occasion, he's talking or reminiscing about Lewis and Clark, who, uh, when they arrived at Great Falls, uh, at the Great Falls of the Missouri River, stopped and laid off for a day and caught five or six nice trout uh, down below the falls. I think the point that, uh, that Brodigan is making of contrasting an idyllic past and what Holden Caulfield would call a pretty crummy present is, uh, is fairly clear. Brodigan's picture of the American landscape of the 1970s is, I'm afraid, too unfortunately true. But his portrait of the past is sentimental. A truer picture emerges from such writers as Ole Rollvogs or Hamlin Garland's bleak pictures of the Midwest rural isolation and deprivation of the 19th century. Or to take a more concrete example, there's a, uh, uh, a delightful and also poignant episode in a, a novel by Justman West entitled Leafy Rivers, in which the original member of the family brings his wife from uh, South Carolina uh, over the mountains through the uh, forest into the Ohio Valley in the late 18th century. The trip takes about six months, and uh, it's pretty traumatic. Uh, for the wife. And when they get there, uh, the first thing she demands of him is that he lay everything aside and clear, lay bare, uh, a circle a half mile in diameter. Uh, they live in the wagon until that's done. And when it's cleared, then she lets him build the cabin. And it's right in the middle. Uh, she was uh, a kind of, you know, exaggerated 18th century suburbanite but uh, <laughs> uh, she did it on purpose. And I think one, one can understand her feelings, if not, uh, if not the waste involved. The point I wish to make is that the idyllic past was something considerably less than that to the people who lived it. To them, it was a harsh and arduous present, devoid of most of the comforts and luxuries which we now regard as necessities. If we long for their cleaner air, we're not about to give up our air conditioners. As Brodigan points out, much of our energy is directed towards using Bunyan-esque means to achieve apple seed ends. In one chapter of Trout Fishing, for example, he tells the story of Mr. Norris, 32 years old and three times married, an individual caught up in the urban rat race for the good life. Advised by a friend to try some camping and trout fishing, for his budding executive ulcers, he decides to give it a try. So I quote, The next morning, Mr. Norris went down to a sporting goods store and charged his equipment. He charged a 9 by 9 drive finished tent with an aluminum center pole. 
Then he charged an Arctic sleeping bag filled with eider down and an air mattress and an air pillow to go with the sleeping bag. He also charged an air alarm clock to go along with the idea of night and waking in the morning. He charged a two-burner Coleman stove and a Coleman lantern and a folding aluminum table and a big set of interlocking aluminum cookware and a portable icebox. The last things he charged were his fishing tackle and a bottle of insect repellent. He left the next day for the mountains. The first 16 campgrounds he stopped at were filled with people. At the 17th campground, a man had just died of a heart attack and the ambulance <laughs> attendants were taking down his tent. Mr. Norris pitched his tent right there and set up all his equipment at once and soon had it all going at once. And after he had finished eating a dehydrated beef stroganoff dinner, he turned off all his equipment with a master air switch and went to sleep. Then there's a, a little scene which was just too long to quote, but then they bring the body back. Uh, there being no room apparently anywhere else. Well, Brodigan's image of a society too crowded for burial room is exaggerated, but the rest of his picture errs, if at all, on the side of conservatism. Our Appleseedish desire to escape to nature expresses itself in terms of 24-foot trailers pulled by 350 horsepower engines, and our goal is usually two or three trees shading an area which for sure has electrical hookups and flush toilets. And to those who argue that such matters as these are insignificant in relation to the larger, more pressing problems of pollution and resource conservation, I would say our actions regarding the larger issues will ultimately be no more than a reflection of our attitudes regarding the small. There's still a sufficiency of bunionism today, pure bunionism that is. Iowa's own ex-football broadcaster, ex-movie star, soon to be ex-governor of the state of California would have apparently been content to let the redwoods fall. But our most complex problems stem from confused appleseedism. One can argue conservation and or proper land use, for example, on both sides of the Sailorville Dam project. Or take the case of the controversy over construction of a highway through the Hardin County Greenbelt. The idea is naturally repugnant to appleseed mentalities, many of whom would be far less concerned, if indeed concerned at all, if the proposed route were through productive farmland. But disregarding that, to oppose construction of highways while maintaining our Bunyan-esque faith in the automobile as a necessary means of transportation, two or three per family, is to engage in futility comparable to planting apple trees in concrete. Far too often, the appleseed mentality assumes that the way to solve our environmental problems is to find a Bunyanite solution. There's nothing wrong, necessarily, in pressuring General Motors to install pollution controls on automobiles. But if we then move to the country and buy another one, what have we gained? The legend of Daniel Boone provides a valuable lesson for our time, if we will but heed it. Essentially, the legend is double and seemingly contradictory, but in fact valid and illuminating. We celebrate two Daniel Boones, essentially. There's the figure of the man who led the pioneers through the Cumberland Gap and opened up the West for settlement. And there's that other figure who appears more often, I think, on TV, a kind of tall, gaunt, woodsman, hunter, explorer figure who, as legend would have it, so detested society and civilization that he would pull up stakes and move further into the wilderness so soon as he noticed the smoke from a neighbor's cabin. James Fenimore Cooper caught the spirit of the Boone legend in his leather stocking tales. His hero, Natty Bumpo, is essentially an outlaw, a man who cannot stand, <coughs> excuse me, who cannot stand the destructiveness of progress or the constraints of civilization, yet, ironically, by escaping to the frontier, he prepares the way for the settlers who follow to clear and tame the land. A natural man, a kind of exponent of primitivism himself, he makes the progress of civilization inevitable. I mentioned earlier William Faulkner's novel, The Bear. This is certainly one of the most important novels in our literature because it states so dramatically the terms of the dilemma the legend of Ban Daniel Boone incorporates. In that novel, The Bear, a symbol of the spirit of the wilderness is killed by a man who is named, appropriately enough, 
Boone Hagenbeck. After Boone kills the bear, the wilderness tract that has provided the setting for the novel is sold to a lumber company, which builds a railroad so as to more effectively haul out the fallen trees. Now, it would be possible to interpret the episode from an appleseed perspective as one more example of our failure to conserve, as an example, in short, of our Bunyan-esque exploitation of nature in the 19th century. But Faulkner is not so naive. The railroad clearly stands for progress, that's true. And progress is just as clearly linked with the destruction of the wilderness. The complication comes when we note that the bear is on three different occasions described in terms that relate it to the locomotive. What does Faulkner mean by linking the spirit of the wilderness with the engine that destroys it? I think his purpose is to insist upon the mutual dependence of each upon the other. If bears need wilderness, so do lumber companies. If fish need clean water, so do we, if no, for no more reason than to carry off our human and industrial waste. We cannot maintain the standard of living most of us consider necessary without imposing an intensive drain on our natural resources, without polluting our air and our waterways. Our task is to find that point of mutual balance that Faulkner suggests is necessary. The problems that we face today stem not so much from our being unthinking Bunyanists as our ancestors of a century ago possibly were. Our problem today stems, let me repeat, from the fact that we are Appleseedish in our concern, Bunyan-esque in our desires. Again, Faulkner is prophetic. On its first trip into the wilderness, the logging train spooks a bear, which climbs a tree along the road, or the track. Three hours later, when the train returns with a load of lumber, the bear is halfway down the tree. But it frantically climbs again. So, out of sympathy for the bear, Logging operations are suspended for three days and until the bear comes down, in fact, after which the clear cutting, which will make the region uninhabitable for the bear anyway, is resumed. Yet both the loggers and the man who owned the wilderness are satisfied with a deed well done. Most of us, I am afraid, are like the logging operators, willing to make a gesture towards converse conservation so long as it doesn't affect our well-being in the long run. The subsidence of public opposition to the Alaska pipeline in the face of the Arab oil embargo is a case in point. The legend of Daniel Boone reflects our cultural ambiguity regarding nature and land use. Basically, it is a myth suggesting the interdependence of progress and preservation, and it speaks bluntly to our Bunyan-esque optimism and to our Appleseedish good intentions, telling us that there is no solution without sacrifice. It reminds us that the gains our society has made in the way of progress toward the good life have been accomplished by a corresponding sacrifice of our natural resources. Conversely, it warns us that whatever gains we hope to make in the future in restoring or preserving an environmental equilibrium must be accomplished by a corresponding sacrifice of the good life. Either way, we measure our gains in terms of what we are willing to give up. Thank you, Dr. Burns. You will have an opportunity to question Dr. Burns following the panel. We now present a reactor panel who will speak from their particular disciplines on specific aspects of land use planning. I'm happy to introduce our panel moderator, Louise Lex. Louise is a doctoral candidate at Iowa State University in professional studies with a political science emphasis. During each spring quarter, she teaches a political science course, Women in, Pol in American Politics. Louise is a member of the League of Women Voters of Ames and is a former president of the League of Women Voters in Schenectady County, New York. She has lived in Ames about two years. Louise will introduce the members of our panel.
who makes the decisions that affect our land and land use? Farmers, business people, citizens advisory committees and groups, legislative bodies, and citizens within the framework of state and local legislation. Our panel members represent farmers, business people, and citizens, as well as a city planning commission. They will respond to Dr. Burns' speech in their perspective. Following the panel reaction, we will open it to discussion and questions from the audience. We welcome your comments. We would appreciate very much, because time is running very short tonight, if you will keep your comments to a minimum and ask the questions. <laughs> um, it happens. John Thurston is a microbiologist with the Animal Laboratory, Disease Laboratory. He's been a resident of AIM since December 1961. He is a former member of the City Council. Currently, he chairs the AIM City Plan Commission. John has an interest in AIMS in terms of an urban dweller. He will respond to Dr. Burns' speech as an urban dweller and as the chairperson of the AIM City Planning Commission. Reine Friedrich has lived in Ames all his life. He has a real estate business and he has in, been involved in real estate from all aspects. His father came to Ames in 1928 and established a construction business. And from there, the building and contracting and rental and sale of real estate has developed. Reine will be speaking to you and reacting as a realtor and a businessman. He has played an important part in the growth of this community. Walter Geppinger, our third panel speaker, has been involved in farming and farm management since 1933. His background is so impressive that I can only give you the highlights of his more than 25 years involvement in farming and the development of international relations. You might be interested in knowing that he has traveled to 60 countries on behalf of American agriculture. He is president of the National Corn Growers Association and has been president for a period of 17 years. He has postponed a trip to Rome to the World Food Conference so that he can be a part of this conference tonight. I think that he has a very good grasp of the importance of agriculture to Iowa. And he will be speaking to you and reacting from the standpoint of a farmer. We'll start, first of all, with John. We'll move on to Reine and conclude with Walter. Louise, uh, fellow panel persons, I, uh, <laughs> I find that my uh, reaction to almost anything at this time of evening is to uh, beat on my high chair with my spoon and demand dinner. <laughs> but I will curb this natural urge and uh, keep, uh, it will help me keep my remarks brief. Also, I'm sure that you'd like to get to the audience participation uh, part of this program. A few years ago, within the context of uh, a political nominating speech that I heard on television, one of the speakers used a phrase that I have remembered for no reason at all, because I didn't know what it meant then and I still don't know. 
but he said, beware of a man with a book under his arm. <laughs> I think uh, this evening we can say and say it with meaning, beware of a man who has read a book. <laughs> he will make you think. <clears throat> Dr. Burns obviously has read a book or two, and I'm sure we are all busy thinking about ourselves in terms of the figures he has discussed. As a native of northern Ohio, where Johnny Appleseed apparently did his thing with apple seeds every now and then, I feel I ought to identify with him, and perhaps subconsciously I do. But within the role of a citizen serving on a city plan commission, in particular the one here in Ames, I find myself identifying with that bear who was driven up the tree. <laughs> that bear in that tree, like the citizen on the plan commission, suddenly has a new perspective from which to view the activities of the Johnny Appleseeds, Paul Bunyans, and Daniel Boones. His view, though greater than if earthbound, may be less than enjoyable because if he spends too much time enjoying the view, he may suddenly have an intense local concern when he finds someone cutting down his tree in temporary residence. The point I want to make, of course, is that a local plan commission primarily has to be concerned with local issues. This does not mean that apple seedish good intentions and bunyanesque optimism are absent from the uh, local scene. Uh, I don't know how others on the plan commission uh, view the, our work, but at times I feel that we should wear black and white uh, striped shirts at commission meetings as we play the role of referee in the continuing game between the Johnny Appleseeds and Paul Bunyans. I don't believe either in the myth of Johnny Appleseed and Paul Bunyan or in Dr. Burns' analysis that there is much indication that either character was noted for planning. They were activists who went out and acted on their point of view because of total conviction that they had the answer to whatever the question was. The concept of a group that plans but has no power to in instigate action is a difficult concept for people to grasp, particularly, I think, in this country where we all feel that we have to be active and do something. I find as a plan commission member that I frequently talk about action when, in fact, all we really can do is recommend action by another group, in our case, the city council. Now, it's true that historically, I think the council will ordinarily has taken the plan commission's recommendations seriously and has uh, ordinarily uh, approved them, but they are not obligated to do so. Many times individuals, apple seeds and bunions both, have come to the plan commission with plans and I detect a sense of puzzlement on their part that no one has thought of what they are about to propose. In other words, they come to us and are just amazed that we haven't thought of the things that they're going to talk about. They then suggest a mall for downtown or parking ramps in the university shopping area or any one of many worthy projects that also have been suggested many times before. The only thing they don't suggest is how the project is to be financed, nor do they volunteer to take the job of, of achieving the goal they suggest. The local plan commission then can only recommend, and as a practical matter, it will recommend only that which is politically feasible at the council level. A case in point is that of annexation, which has been defeated at the polls, and despite the logic for the city to gain control of the land it will eventually expand into, the plan commission, as far as I know, has no serious intentions of suggesting annexation in the near future. I'm speaking in terms of the city of Ames. Nevertheless, we are working on a proposal of what categories the land peripheral to the city should be zoned into. We will then have to enter into the political process of convincing the county to honor our adopted uh, uh, and adopt our proposal. I would certainly have to agree with Dr. Burns that relative to our subject this evening, there is no solution without sacrifice. I think that one of the most difficult sacrifices that will have to be made in, is to recognize that not all of us can make all decisions regarding land use. I detect that as people seriously consider national or state land use policies, 
there will be increasing reluctance to allow a final conclusion by someone else because I think that the point will bear in on them that the sacrifice we make may in fact be our home. Thank you very much. Involved with the development of our land. The realtors have a comment or a statement that they have developed into a book entitled Under All is Land. And I'd like you to think about that for a minute. Under All is Land. Land is the basic resource, physical resource that we have from which to develop and develop our interests. And we're living in a country where we have the right, the freedom, to have title and ownership of a piece of property. We have these rights, a bundle of rights that go with the land. We take these rights and then we go and develop it as best as we know how with the talents and abilities that we have. Our economy, or our country I might say, is geared around the free enterprise system. And with that is the almighty dollar. And in business, we get down to the almighty buck and making a profit. And this is a motivator. It's a motivator among all of us to different degrees, but uh, it takes money to live. Okay, now going back in history, we started out with the raw land. At that time, we were not developed to the standard of living that we are experiencing now, and our time was basically spent on the land uh, producing crops, food, and it, it involved most of our daily life. With science and technology and knowledge, basic knowledge, we have developed the ability to make better use of our times, to raise our standard of living. We don't have to de devote as much of our time or as many of our people towards this business of agriculture. We are then free to use this time for other purposes and other interests. We then take this time to make our environment what we think is a better place to live. So then we get into other areas of transportation, industry and commercial and residential and recreation. But under all this is land. As a home builder, I have a pride that I'm trying to produce the best kind of housing that I know how 
as economically possible for the least dollar. There are thousands of parts and pieces that go into the creation of this structure. We have to work with many, many people. We have to work with government. We have to work uh, at uh, federal, state, and local levels of government. I'm saying to you, as a general grouping of people here representing the interests of the general public, not a special interest group, that we're trying to create what you, the American public, want. And so we respond to what your likes and dislikes are. Today we're involved with one of these things that may ultimately change how I'm going to work as a home builder. The economy certainly has had some very strong effects. Today, it's very unfortunate, but it's fact, that across our great land, about 70% of our American families cannot realize this great American dream of owning your own home. It's really sad. Well, this is a real challenge to us as builders and developers and realtors. We've got to come up with a better mousetrap. We've got to try harder to create this dwelling, be it a single family dwelling or multiple housing or what have you. We've got to keep on trying through science and technology manufacturing and what have you, to do a better job. We're a growing nation. Population is still on the increase. Land is not. We have a limited supply of land. And so land is going to become more valuable. We must make better use of the land. And this is where we get into land use planning. I am a proponent of the free enterprise system. It's helped to make this country great. It provides the incentives that all of us can go out and do our thing and achieve and have pride in doing it and also make some money. And then your kids and my kids will get the education that they should have and a decent place to live and also have good working conditions and an ideal environment for a place of work. The Iowa 2000 program uh, was a good thing for our state. It's something that uh, I think we're showing the nation that we're leaders and we're, we're thinking progressively. And in that, the report, the final report showed that uh, continued economic growth for Iowa is a good thing. This is going to be a challenge then for land use. Another thing uh, from the Iowa Development Commission uh, is the, the business of bringing industry into our state. Over the last uh, couple years, we have created something like 25,000 new jobs in the state of Iowa. But on the other hand, some industries have gone under. One large one in Cedar Rapids uh, lost several thousand jobs. The net gain, and this is what I'm pointing out, is that the net gain of, of industry losses in the state of Iowa just about equals what new industry brought into the state in terms of jobs. Well, we have our young people to think about, and we want to keep them here in our state. We don't want them to go elsewhere. So this is another challenge for us to think about and how we're going to use our land. Finally, and I appreciate uh, some of our state uh, governmental people here, 
uh, Reed Crawford and Senator Murray. Uh, this land use plan is under consideration now by our state. And I, as a builder and a developer, have a real concern about who is going to call the shots? Who's going to administer that program? Who's going to tell us how to do our job? Well, I feel, and I'm sure that my colleagues feel, that we know more about Ames, Iowa than anybody uh, else. And so if there's to be a plan of control, we think we can do it better locally than having someone either from a state or maybe a national level telling us how to run our business. Now, there could be some things that Washington could, Washington could do on a research basis and help us out. We would welcome this. But as to decide how a piece of ground is going to be used, I think the people within this community uh, should be left for that decision. And I'm going to sit down with that. Kind of like Abe Lincoln uh, said, he uh, always carried his speeches around on an envelope and uh, <laughs> rang out of envelopes. So, does anybody have a handy one with them? I, <laughs> I rather like the remark of Dr. Burns when he said, uh, Either way, we are going to measure our gains on what uh, we are willing to give up. And this certainly is a, an era of compromise because in agriculture, as uh, as the field that I'm interested in, basically, we have to give up some things that relate to yesteryear for today and tomorrow. In other words, many of the things that make for successful agriculture and our capability to feed large numbers of people besides ourselves are things which, if we had our druthers, we possibly wouldn't be using. We'd probably be back to uh, the use of the horse because we could devote 25 percent of our land area to a pasture that the mare could uh, uh, be on uh, while she's uh, nursing her foal. Uh, land uh, that same 25 percent would have to uh, produce some of the uh, hay for uh, winter use. It'd have to produce some of the oats uh, during the heavy work period of the horse. But we can't go back to that period because we have now set our sights and adjusted our economy in the United States and have placed dependency of other people on our shoulders to a point where we are using fossil fuels. We're large consumers, we, although we are probably only using somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 percent of the consumption of fossil fuels, basically diesel fuel now on the farm, uh, 5 percent of what the entire nation uses. It's still a very large amount. And all these things, again, as I pointed out, are a compromise with today. The little traveling that I have done in the past. Uh, uh, fortunately, at an early age uh, in life, uh, I did have the opportunity to travel. Uh, Mari and I uh, went on uh, our honeymoon uh, back in 1935 and uh, saw some things which immediately impressed me. Uh, one of the things was that uh, when, I made this, when we made this trip, we were in Europe where we saw land being used right up to the railroad ties. People were farming it for, uh, intensively for vegetables and other crops which uh, were for human use and livestock use that we were just completely ignoring here in the United States. And I came home and did some uh, quick mental computation that if we took the land that was in railroad right of way in the United States and farmed it as the people of Europe were farming it, uh, we could support a nation of 50 million people on the land that is in the good rainfall zone and the good soil zone of the United States. Now, this is a tragic commentary on our prodigal use of the land. Perhaps it's a good place for wildlife and still is today. But we have many uh, times overused our lands so far as grading. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, the uh, right of way wasn't nearly as large as it is here. The same is true of their highways. They even today are very, very much more restricted. Even in areas where there is heavy snowfall and the amount of land that they can take for uh, construction of superhighways. 
So this prodigal use uh, has uh, really impressed me, and I'm never uh, going to relinquish my stand on the point that we need to retract uh, some of the types of engineering that we are utilizing today and are uh, pinpointed for tomorrow. One of the things that travel also did for me in an early period was to impress me with the fact that you cannot have democracy where there isn't an adequate food supply. If democracy is going to exist, there has to be more than enough food to begin with, so you don't have to have a dictatorship to uh, distribute it properly among the people. The other thing is, where there's a food shortage, people are spending so much of their time in the effort to supply themselves with uh, food and shelter and clothing that the children don't have time to go to school. And there isn't enough money generated even in an economy that is only supporting itself from a food and shelter standpoint with nothing left over for the other arts that uh, were mentioned here that follow immediately after proper agriculture and adequate agriculture that the people didn't have the money even to set up uh, educational uh, structure. So food is a basis, an adequate and capable food economy involving farmers and a distribution system, a marketing system, a transportation system, and a communication system that makes it all work. This is a very underlying, underlying column and strength of a good democracy. And I think we have to think about that when we start to think about <coughs> Iowa, because Iowa contains one-fourth of all the grade A land in the United States. Now that's a redundant statement because I think everybody in this room has heard it, but you can't say that to yourself often enough. You look out on the prairie around Ames here, and you look and you take a trip north through uh, the north central section of Iowa, and you're in the heart of uh, some of the very best land in all the world. And I've never been anywhere where the land is as good as it is here outside of the United States. There is some good land over in central Illinois, the Black Prairie over there too. But when you, when you go to other countries, you cannot find anything that compares to this. And this is something that we uh, have to recognize as a tremendous valuable asset that we must protect as the years go on. Now we have had a lot of agriculture performed in this state and in other surrounding states on land that should never have been plowed up or if it has been plowed up should have been used in a much more sensible and in a better rotational way. In other words, row crops, meaning today corn and soybeans in Iowa, are not good things for the land in some of the southern portions of the state, the western and the more rolling sections of northeastern Iowa. And even in the black level land area, the land needs a rest once in a while. It needs it from the standpoint of microbiology. It needs it from the standpoint of restructuring of uh, total amount of humus. It needs it from a uh, soil insect standpoint. When we get into the role.